Hello and welcome to a slightly different vlog to usual because this will be a farewell to the Qantas Link Boeing 717 and also a flight report on board three flights from Canberra to Melbourne, Launceston and then finishing up in Sydney that I took in late December 2023 to say farewell. Along the journey I've got some great views of this great aircraft on the airport apron as well as in flight so let's get into it. Here we are starting in Canberra Airport early on a Friday morning as I wanted to get breakfast and then sit at the gate and film my aircraft arriving. I ended up getting a lot of footage at Melbourne so I'll delay my discussion about the aircraft design until there. Canberra Airport is a very clean, modern and full of what I'm assuming is art with these displays all around it and I suppose they look fine although I was here to see this piece of art, the Boeing 717-200. Registration Victor Hotel, Yankee, Quebec, Sierra. This was assembled in Boeing's Long Beach plant in 2004 where it flew with Midwest Airlines, Mexicana Click, which is a regional Mexican airline, and then in 2013 joined the Qantas Link stable and has been flying with them ever since. I didn't realise this until afterwards but there's a fire truck emptying out the pipes in the background. Boarding was called and these glass aero bridges provided a good view of the aircraft. Qantas have recently announced changes to the rules with filming on board their flights and we're not meant to film the crew or other passengers without permission which seems reasonable so I've made some clunky attempts to avoid filming faces. The first few rows are bigger business class seats in a 2-2 layout while the main economy cabin is in a 2-3 layout. I'm sitting right up the back because I wanted to get a good view of those turbofan engines. Being an older aircraft, these still come with individual overhead air vents which I'm always a fan of as I always seem to cook in planes. There's adequate leg room for a short haul aircraft and there's a tray table that folds out but best of all are the views of the engine. There's no power plugs that I could find. You have to be careful not to sit in the last few rows as they don't have windows because of the engines but my seat allows you to see the fan blades without blocking the view of everything else as well. QantasLink are retiring all of their 717s by Q2 2024, with quite a few already having left Australia for the last time. The primary replacement is the new Airbus A220-300, and here's the first one, Victor Hotel X-Ray 4 Alpha, painted in a rather brilliant looking indigenous art livery. I'm looking forward to flying one of these in coming months and the whole fleet of them are due to be delivered soon. There's an Embraer E190 in the background although it's heading up to Brisbane so it needs more fuel and a longer runway so we get to skip ahead of it. I'll talk more about that aircraft later as I get some great views in Melbourne and Launceston. I'll stop talking and let you enjoy this build up. As anyone who has flown on the 717s will know, their takeoffs are quite aggressive with higher rates of climb thanks to those powerful engines. In fact, that's why they're nicknamed the Mad Dog. In part because of the initials MD, which I'll explain later, but also because it's very fast and makes a lot of noise, like a Mad Dog. The reason for such a high climb rate was because these were designed for very short flights. Therefore they wanted to climb to a high cruising altitude as fast as possible because that's where aircraft are the most efficient. The powerful engines and sleek engineless wings allow for them to achieve this. In case you're wondering, this is what a toilet looks like on a Qantas Link Boeing 717-200. What's more interesting though is the exit door straight ahead at the rear. Unlike the 727, this didn't come with an air stair and if you open this exit, part of the tail will unceremoniously fall off and a slide will appear taking you down to the ground. We reached a cruising altitude of 36,000 feet and you can see how the advantages of pressurised airliners allows us to fly over all this rough weather below us. 
There was a complimentary snack and cold drinks offered, which is fine for a 50 minute flight. We escaped the cloud that was covering much of New South Wales and the ACT and had great views of the green Victorian fields below. Unfortunately, the scratches on my window were pretty distracting, but alas, I guess there's no point fixing a minor problem on an aircraft that is about to be retired. This was just a 50 minute flight, covering 470 kilometers, and where we cruised at 36,000 feet, which is quite high for such a short flight. We started our descent down into Melbourne around Mansfield for a landing from the north. It was a beautiful day with a thin layer of clouds, although unfortunately the audio wasn't great as the engine's frequency seemed to upset the GoPro. Melbourne has both remote gates and air bridges and it was a perfect day for the latter. I organised a longer layover in Melbourne because I figured that there would be a great plane spotting view from the lounge and it did not disappoint. The story of the 717 begins with the Douglas DC-9, which was a rear-engined, narrow-body short-haul airliner launched in 1963. McDonnell and Douglas merged so that the next generation plane was launched and it was called the MD-80. It was longer, had improved wings and the next gen Pratt & Whitney turbofan engines. Then we had the MD-90 which was the next upgrade and first flew in 1993. It was also bigger, got new engines and importantly had an upgraded glass cockpit. Then we saw the MD-95 which interestingly was a reversal of the trend of making everything longer, so this was actually a little shorter. In August 1997, Boeing acquired McDonnell Douglas and rebranded the MD-95 as the Boeing 717. There would be a 717-100 for military purposes and a 717-200 for commercial airlines and that's what I'm flying on today. In the early 2000s, Impulse Airlines signed some long-term leases and were eventually bought out by Qantas who discovered their utility. They were superior to the BAE 146s and generally very reliable and cheap to operate, so they purchased more. They were flown in Jetstar colours and now they're all in Qantas Link colours as you can see here. Here's my aircraft arriving, Victor Hotel November X-Ray November, ordered by TWA before they were acquired by American Airlines and before coming to Australia in 2001 and operated by Qantas Link, Jetstar, Cobham Aviation and now National Jet Systems who operate these for Qantas Link. On board you'll notice that there is no business class and the whole cabin is economy in a 2-3 layout. Once again I was sitting right at the back to enjoy the music from the Rolls Royce BR700 turbofans. Thankfully the window on this aircraft was less scratched and the different angle provided a great view of the fan blades. Today you're flying on a Qantas Link Boeing 717. Let's take off to Launceston and I'll talk more after this spool up and rotation.
headed south over Port Phillip Bay on what was a beautiful day for flying and climbed up to a cruising altitude of 35,000 feet, which was impressive for such a short flight. There was a healthier snack this time with carrots, celery, biscuits and a dip and some grape juice. The flight was only 46 minutes, so it wasn't long before we crossed the northern coastline of Tasmania with this beautiful view of what I think was Devonport. I was only here a month ago and it was a fantastic road trip around the state, and views like this made me want to visit once again soon. We descended down through a layer of clouds and overflew the airport, which you can see in the background now, so that we could spin around and land from the south. Now I don't know about you, although I love the noise the engine makes as it throttles up and down maintaining the correct approach to the runway. If you don't like these sounds, then there might be something wrong with you, or otherwise just sit further forward as it's surprisingly quiet in the first few rows. By the way, I'm experimenting a little with these videos as I focus more on the Avgeekery than my traditional flight reviews. In these, I'm focusing more on the planes themselves than reviewing the product, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts. In this video, for example, I'm including far more plane spotting, sights and sounds rather than comments on the lounge and food, etc. Let me know what you think. It was a beautiful day in Launceston and around 20 degrees Celsius, which was a great welcome for my first visit here. There's no aero bridges here, so we got a great view of the plane, although I would imagine that the novelty would wear off during a Tasmanian winter. Inside the terminal, I found a table near the window, chatted with a few of geeks and pulled out the camera. This is an interesting sight because it's the new Qantas Link Embraer E190 operated by Alliance Airlines. These are joining the A220 as the backbone of the Qantas Link jet fleet. They have a much longer range than the 717, and they're not directly replacing it, but they are making up a new fleet, so they kind of are in an indirect way. These are Brazilian-built airliners from the E-Jet family, consisting of the shorter E170 and 175, and this E190 and 195. The latter is stretched longer, has larger wings, new engines, a larger tail, and more emergency exits over the wings. This one was built in 2008 and came to Australia in 2020 where it remains with Alliance, but painted in the Qantas Link colours. By the way, Launceston Airport really does provide some brilliant plane spotting views, with the aircraft rotating directly in front of you. Here's that Embraer taking off to Brisbane. Here's my plan for what could well be my final Boeing 717 flight ever and pay special attention to the thrust reverses on the engine. These redirect the engine's thrust forward and would also operate kind of like air brakes catching the incoming air, moving around the engine cowling from the front. A problem with this system though is that this reversing air will disrupt the flow past the rudder dramatically, reducing its authority. So to counter this, when the pilot presses the rudder pedals, the nose wheel will actually turn slightly and help steer the aircraft during landing. Most narrow-body jets operate around the world have two underwing engines, such as the Boeing 737 and the newer Airbus A320. But did you know that the 737 was originally designed to have two tail-mounted engines, and there's multiple reasons for this, although they did end up sticking them under the wings, which has now caused problems with the increasingly larger 737 MAX turbofans. These jets are designed to operate out of smaller airports, where crew access to the luggage hold as well as passenger access to the cabin is made a lot easier if the plane is overall lower to the ground. Have a look at this guy accessing the luggage hold on the 717. And now have a look at the taller A320 where they have to use machines to lift everything up. 
The reason why the A320 is so tall is because it has to allow room for the engines to sit underneath the wings, but rear positioned engines like the 717 mean that the wings can be as low as they want. The wings are also kept clean and more aerodynamic. Another advantage is that because the engines are close to the center line on the 717, there is less of a problem with asymmetric thrust in the case of an engine failure, which allows them to build a smaller tail fin. But the problem is that the engine maintenance is more difficult because it's physically higher up to reach. Another issue with rear mounted engines is that the wheels can kick up both water and stones, which can then be ingested by engines that are located behind them. This is especially a problem with the 717, as those engines are just so large. For comparison's sake, here's a Fokker 100, which is a similar type of aircraft, but with relatively smaller hair dryers, and don't forget to check out my vlog on board that. But back to the 717, there are these small deflectors behind the landing gear to hopefully stop this from happening. There used to be a much larger contraption on the nose wheel, although it was decided that it wasn't worth the extra weight, when Aussie runways are generally pretty good. Another design feature unique to these types of jets is the T-tail. The horizontal stabilizer had to be lifted up from the usual place on the lower tail, as to avoid getting cooked by the engine's exhausts. And speaking of the engines, they are BR700s designed in a joint venture between BMW and Rolls-Royce. The turbofan jets and produce 18,700 pounds of thrust each. Of interest, modified versions of these engines have been redesignated as F-130s, and they will be assembled in the United States and installed into the B-52 Stratofortress. My flight was called and it was a perfect day for a remote gate where you get all these great airport sounds and smells, well, mostly fuel, APUs, and air conditioners. Qantas use these ramps instead of stairs because their mathematicians have worked out that it's faster, which I suppose makes sense as they are much easier for anyone with mobility challenges due to the gradual incline rather than traditional steps. Again, there was a great view of the aircraft and a friendly welcome from the flight attendant who I've now worked out how to blur their faces in my editing program. And we enter first the business cabin, followed by economy. I do tend to try and rush on board first so that I can film the cabin without showing other passengers' faces. While I believe it is legal to film people in a public place, it is just a courtesy and fair enough if they don't want their face on the internet. Again, I was sitting right at the back so that I could fully appreciate the sounds from the two turbofans just behind me. You can see the northerly breeze here as the red remove before flight tag is moving around under the wing and the fan blades are spinning along at a decent pace even though the engine is turned off. Another interesting fact about the 717 turbofan is the starting process. Today you're flying on a Qantas Link Boeing 717. Unlike most aircraft, they always start engine number two because they found that starting engine number one would drain the cabin lights. This presumably has something to do with the onboard electrical generation and wiring. The doors were closed and it's always nice when the seat next to you is empty and the engines were throttled up, moving us towards the runway and after more taxiing, we were ready to take off again towards the north. I'll stop talking and let you enjoy the noise from those two turbo fans pull up for the last time. passed over Tasmania's northern coastline at 18,000 feet and started our trek across Bass Strait. While it was a fairly clear day, those white capped waves down there suggest that a boat crossing probably wouldn't have been overly smooth. In fact, Bass Strait is known to be notoriously rough. At around 32,000 feet, we passed Flinders Island, which is bigger than I realized, and according to Wikipedia, has a population of 900 people.
This was a longer flight, so a hot bite was provided, which again came with fruit juice. Here we are crossing the Victorian coastline near Cape Conran at 34,000 feet at 459 knots, which translates to around 850 kilometers an hour. We actually left Launceston a little earlier than planned for the one hour and 39 minute journey, although bad weather and traffic in Sydney delay our arrival as we had to do a few loops just north of Canberra to fill in some time and we slowly reduced our altitude. The aircraft now is Victor Hotel Yankee Quebec Tango, which was built in 2004. Like the first plane today, it also flew with Midwest Airlines and then Mexicana Click. Then in 2013, it came to Australia. Eventually, we broke through the clouds just over very southwestern Sydney before taking a right and flying out over Royal National Park with some great views of Gary Beach from 5,600 feet and 460 kilometers an hour and the setting sun in the background. There also appeared to be some storms over Wollongong and they were probably connected with the bad weather that delayed our arrival into Sydney as well. Then we lined up for our arrival into Sydney on runway 34 left. Of interest, this is one of the longer runways around and actually designated as an emergency landing site for the Space Shuttle Orbiter. But sadly today, it would be the final time I land on it on board a Boeing 717. Once again, I love the noise from these engines as they modulate the throttles. I'm sure other aircraft do this as well, although I guess the passengers aren't usually so close to the engines, so you don't realise it's happening. It's rare for specific aircraft types to have such a special place in the hearts of pilots, ground crews, flight attendants and passengers, and like the 747, I think this is one of them. It's interesting to see that when the 717 was first launched, Boeing struggled to sell any. But now on the second hand market they're actually very popular although the aging process is now finally catching up with them and cleaner and more efficient airliners like the A220 you saw earlier really are better in many ways. I'd love to hear your stories from on board at these incredible machines. Please comment below and join the discussion. If you enjoyed the video then please give it a thumbs up and check out my channel for many other aviation and a few space videos from around Australia and the world. Thanks for watching and I'll let you enjoy the final stages of the journey.